Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I am back with another true crime case and today I'll be talking about the case of Eton Pats. On the morning of May 25th, 1979, and was the last day of school before the Memorial Day weekend, it was very hectic at his household. Now his mother had ran a daycare out of the loft in their apartment and she was also watching over her two-year-old son and was also watching over another two-year-old who had spent the night at their apartment. Now his older sister did not want to get out of bed that morning, but Etan jumped out of bed and was wanting more independence and begged his mother to let him watch the bus stop on his own. Now she did this with some reluctance. She could actually see the bus stop from her apartment and walked him out the door and let him go off and he was carrying a one dollar bill so he could buy a soda but he was never seen again. When Etan did not return home from school that afternoon she started calling around and she learned that he had never made it to school and in fact he never even made it on the bus. Now this case alarmed many parents all over the country and hit their worst fears, their children. And this also changed the way how many parents watched over their children as well. Not long after his disappearance, the family's loft was converted into a command center for his case, where police investigators, volunteers, and searchers would come and get the latest information and talk about what they have found um, and other evidence and clues to where Etan might be. Etan's image spread quickly around the city. He was on the front pages of newspapers and he was also on news broadcasts. A missing poster with an illustration of Etan's hair peeking out from a cap was plastered around the city. He was also said to be the first child to be put on the milk carton, which as we all know was a huge thing up until the Amber Alert in 1996. It was also helped find a lot of children within those years as well. And neighbors were called that the police would stop by their apartments, search it room by room, and also ask them questions about Etan's disappearance. And unfortunately, this led to no clues. Despite all the media coverage from this case, no answers came. There were many suspects throughout the years, including child molester Jose Ramos, who is actually a friend of somebody who used to walk Etan home from the school bus stop. Over the year, new developments would bring renewed attention to the case, and in 2000, police actually spent eight hours digging in a basement of a building where, where Ramos used to live. They actually did find bones, but it turned out that those bones belonged to pets and not humans, so that also led to no answers. In 2012, authorities dug up a workshop of a handyman who actually knew Etan and was the person who gave Etan the $1 bill that he was seen carrying away to buy a soda on the day of his disappearance. Now they did this because they learned that he had recently poured concrete in the basement right after Etan went missing. So they thought that he had taken Etan, killed him, and then buried him in his basement and then poured concrete over to cover up any smell or any disturbance in the basement as well. But they also did not find anything related to Etan's case. Even though they did not find Etan's remains, this did bring up a new wave of media coverage on the case. A few weeks later, a man from New Jersey by the name of, Ho of Jose Lopez actually called investigators and said that his brother-in-law may be responsible for Etan's disappearance and his name was Pedro Hernandez. Now back in 1979, Hernandez was an 18 year old high school dropout who had just recently moved to New York City. He worked as a store clerk in a bodega near Etan's bus stop. Not long after Etan's disappearance, maybe even days after, Hernandez returned to his hometown in New Jersey. Once he returned to New Jersey, he got a job in a dress factory and and then he started telling people that he had killed a boy in New York City. He had told his, at the time, future wife-to-be, who is now his ex-wife, that he had killed a boy and from what he said to her, she believed that he had to be at least a teenager from what she claims Hernandez told him. He had also confessed to a church elder 
and there's no real description of what Hernandez said to him, so we don't know if he gave a description of Etan or not. But also, an old childhood friend believed that he had killed an African American boy, and so the testimonies differed, but in the end, he still did kill somebody. After his brother-in-law called investigators, Hernandez was then taken in for questioning and he was with detective for several hours before he relented and confessed to murdering Etan. He said he had lured Etan into the bodega's basement and there he attacked him. Hernandez said he grabbed him by the neck and started to choke him, but he left the boy alive. But then he put Etan into a plastic bag and left him about one street away. Now, if you say that you left a kid alive but then shoved him into a plastic bag while he was still alive, he's going to suffocate because he cannot get any fresh air. So if he claims he didn't kill him, when he was choking him, he still did kill him when he put him into that plastic bag, which just, it disgusts me so much. <sighs> Police announced just days before the 33rd anniversary of Etan's disappearance that they had made an arrest in the case. Without Etan's remains, the police had a uphill battle against them. So what they used is they used Hernandez, Hernandez's own words against him, which they showed the jury video recordings of his statements to police around the time that he was arrested. They also had the people Hernandez had confessed to there as well as witnesses for the prosecution against Hernandez. Hernandez's defense claimed that at his age 56, he did not really know the difference between real life and fantasy and that he could have confessed to something that he believes he's done, but he did not actually do it. Now that doesn't really make any sense saying that he believes he did it even though he didn't do it. So did he do it or did he not do it? Like. It, it, that just doesn't really make any sense to me. Now, Hernandez's youngest daughter actually testified for him, and she claims that he saw him talking to angelic women and demons all the time, that she would also see him talking to himself and would also would water a tree branch to make it grow. The defense argued that Ramos had more opportunity to kill Etan. But in a way, Hernandez had more of an opportunity because he worked at a bodega just feet from Etan's bus stop. So he could have done it and he had, I believe, he had more means to do it than Ramos did. Now, this trial ended in a mistrial because the jury was deadlocked and a single mother held out that she believed he was not guilty. So in 2016, they held another jury and after a four month free trial on February 14th, 2017, Hernandez was found guilty of murder and kidnapping. Hernandez was sentenced to 25 years to life in prison. So one of the things that causes the most controversy about this case is that Ramos actually did confess to kidnapping and raping a boy on the same day as Etan's disappearance. He gave a description that was similar to Etan's and he said that he was 90% sure that it was Etan that he had kidnapped. But he also said that he had left the boy alive for him to return home and Etan never did. So a lot of people are mixed. Some people believe that Hernandez did it. Some people believe that Ramos did it. We just don't know. There was also no evidence against Ramos saying that he was the one who kidnapped Etan, but then again there was also no evidence against Hernandez saying that he was the one who had kidnapped and killed Etan. And also Etan's remains were never found, so if Ramos did kidnap Etan 
and then let him go he there's no saying that he could have been taken again or wandered somewhere and couldn't find his way home so we really don't know for sure what happened to Yatan on that faithful day. In 2004, Yatan's family had actually filed a civil suit against Ramos for the un unlawful death of Yatan and won two million dollars and the case was left technically unsolved. So I don't really understand, I don't really know what happened with that since somebody else was found guilty, if they had to pay the money back to Ramos or not. I'm interested of finding out what did happen. I just could not find any information saying one thing or another. Etan's disappearance was a landmark moment in child abduction investigations because of his parents' relentless search efforts. And this was also one of the first cases to be broadcast publicly across the nation. Of May 25th, 1983, Four years after Etan's disappearance, President Reagan declared the day as National Missing Children's Day. His case was also one of the cases that helped prompt the creation of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in 1984. After 40 years of Etan's disappearance, his parents finally moved out of the same loft that they lived in since he went missing. Now his parents didn't want to move or even change their phone number in case Itan came home or tried to contact them in some way. But since this case is now finally solved, they felt that it was they felt that it was time for them to move on. So they actually moved to Hawaii to live with their youngest son and spend time with him and their grandchildren with whatever time that they may have left. Let me know down in the comments below who you think was actually responsible for Aton's disappearance. Was it Hernandez or was it Ramos? For me, I'm actually not sure it could have been either of them, but Hernandez is the one who was convicted of murdering and kidnapping a ton. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe and stay tuned for more videos.